Hey, what's up? Shikata Ganai here. Now, today we're going to go over virtualization. So when we're in the cybersecurity field and we want to practice skills for cybersecurity, things like automation and how we use certain tools, a good way to do that is to build your own virtualized lab. And the reason you want to make it virtualized, one, is for uh, performance or efficiency, but also because it makes it a container, as it were, makes it its own uh, segregated field of you know, testing that you can actually use without breaking other things within the environment. So let's say, for instance, I have my Windows 10 host operating system, 64-bit, and I want to run Windows 8 as well, and I want to run Ubuntu Linux as well. Now, I could stand up multiple servers for each one of those operating systems, or I could take each of those and put them in just this one operating system of Windows 10 and host it in there virtually. It'll still be the entire guest OS. You can still visually go to it. You can navigate to it. You can click start, open up different applications, all that kind of good stuff. But they each will have their own segmented sandbox of those OSs. And what controls those is what they call a hypervisor. Now, there's different levels of hypervisor. You have like level one and level two, where level one would be something like Hyper-V or uh, VMware vSphere where they're actually running when the OS is booting, whereas you have something like VirtualBox, which runs as a kind of a level two hypervisor, where it will run on top of the operating system once it boots. And uh, we're going to be using VirtualBox in this particular video because it's easy, it's free, and anybody can get it, and it's on multiple platforms. So we're going to use that for this one. But that's kind of the concept of what virtual machines in general are. But then you also have another virtualized uh topic as well called Docker. So in order to kind of explain that, let's go look at uh, a picture that kind of explains both of those. So on the right-hand side, we can see the virtual machine infrastructure where you have the hypervisor, then you have the different guest OSs. Now I can, again, I can log into those guest OSs and visually see the whole OS, start menu, open up at, you know, office, whatever. And those all run in their own sandbox environment. And then on the other side, we have Docker. Docker is something they have it for both for Windows and for Linux. It's predominantly Linux, but um, Windows does have an implementation of it. Essentially, think of it like you have a base image. Let's, let's pretend it's um, Ubuntu, right? So you have an Ubuntu Linux image, and using this image, we're going to create applications that I can spin up, just those individual applications. Let's say I had... Um, two, two servers. I had uh, Apache web server and then I had Tomcat. I can put those both in a guest OS by themselves and run them and all that kind of stuff. But if I were to do it in a containerized fashion, I would use Docker and I would have this image, let's say Ubuntu, and app A in this picture here, let's just say as an Apache server, it will base its kernel or its underlying base OS on the Ubuntu image. Now, that exact same Ubuntu Im image will also host at B, which in this case we'll say is Tomcat. So that case, Tomcat is still utilizing the exact same Docker image as app A does, and you can do that all the way down the line here with all these different containerized applications. And they use that a lot in uh, environments where you just kind of want to spin an app up real quick and then destroy it, and then spin it up again and destroy it. So you're basing it off a container, so it's kind of an instance of that. So that's what they call Docker, and we're going to actually utilize both of these. But to start, we're going to start with VirtualBox because it's free and everybody can download it. It's pretty awesome. Now, before you get started with any of the virtualization stuff, you got to make sure first that your host machine actually can handle the virtualization. And most laptops and desktops these days usually have this type of technology. But what you want to do is you want to boot into your BIOS of your machine and you want to look for something called Enable Hardware Virtualization or something to along those lines. It may say like VT something or other technology. Uh, you have to enable that because if you were to install VirtualBox without doing that, and let's say your main OS here is a 64-bit machine and a 64-bit OS, if you were not to enable that and you brought up and installed VirtualBox and you went to make a new virtual machine, it would only give you 32-bit options, not 64-bit. So you have to go and do that first. Another thing you have to remember is RAM. Uh, you have to have plenty of RAM to be able to run these because you're going to give each one of these instances, each one of these VMs, their own subset of your own RAM, right? So if I have, like in this case, I have 16 gig of RAM, which is good. And I can run multiple machines and divvy it up the RAM that way. 
I can give like four gig to one, I can give four gig to another, and so on and so forth. I would say stick between eight and 16. Uh, 16 is better. Uh, more than that is actually better, but uh, 16 is budget wise is all right. I wouldn't go below like uh, eight. I wouldn't go like in four gig or anything like that. So eight, 16, something like that would work uh, because you're going to have to divvy it up the RAM. What we're going to do is we're going to actually have this be, uh, we're only going to have one instance of a VM and it's going to be an attacking machine that we're going to use called Parrot OS. And that particular one, we're going to give 8 gig of RAM because I'm not going to bring up any other environments. Uh, if I were not doing it that way, I would then bring up an attacking machine and then I would bring another VM up that is a vulnerable server or application or something and I would uh, attack it from there. So with VirtualBox, I already have it installed. So let me just walk you through kind of what you would do on a Windows side. So here you have the Windows host and you have other ones listed there. You would download it here. And when you're installing it, it may ask something about a network adapter. So on your physical machine, you actually have a physical NIC card that was that's that's plug and play, and that allows you to connect to the internet, connect to the network, that sort of thing. Well, VirtualBox creates a virtualized version of something like that called a virtual adapter, and that's going to be what it uses for things like host-only network and things like that. So that will be created, and if that comes up, just click yes on that and install it. Once you're done installing it, then bring it up, make sure it runs. And then what I recommend, it's not mandatory, but I recommend that you then install the VirtualBox extension pack by downloading it here. And then when you actually click to open it or install it, it'll recognize your installed version of VirtualBox and it will ask you if you want to install the extension pack. So I would recommend doing that so you can use the extra features that it has like USB 3.0 support and all that. So once that's all installed, you should have something similar to this without any different uh, any of the VMs that you see here it should be blank um, I actually have some already built here just for demo purposes um, so when you have this open here and ready to go just the basics of making one and we're not going to do it this way but I'm just going to kind of show you the beginnings of how you would just start off with one is you would start off with the word new up here and then from there you give it a name so right you can say you know Leroy Jenkins or whatever and then from there make your VM and Choose the folder you want to be in, which, by the way, you should always have a nice full hard, I mean, a, a nice hard, <laughs> large hard drive to be able to go ahead and put these in because they're fairly large. Uh, you can also use USB hard drive, but I recommend it be a high speed uh, USB connection for that. And then from there, you can go to your choose your type, Linux or whatever. And uh, here's what I was talking about earlier, that if you didn't enable hardware virtualization, all you would see is 32-bit here. So that's where you would mess with that. Once you're done with that, then you would hit Next, and then you would give it RAM. Okay, in this case, we're saying 2 gig of RAM. And then you would make a new virtual hard disk, and so on. Once you're done through all the steps of that, it will give you like a base VM that doesn't have anything on it, no OS or anything. So what you would do is you would go download or have the ISO of the actual OS that you want. Let's just say, you know, Ubuntu Linux or whatever. And you would then go to the VM that you have. I'm going to use this as an example. And you would go to the settings of it, and you would go to storage, and then you would have a DVD or a CD-ROM, right? I mean, we don't have those anymore. I don't think there's any computers anymore that actually have that. But back in the day, we used to have these things called CD-ROM. You pop that bad boy open and, and put in the DVD or CD or whatever it is. And then from there, you would then do a live CD and then pick your ISO from here. That's one way to do it. We're going to do it a different way today. And uh, you would go to File. And you see here where it says Import Appliance and Export Appliance. So let's pretend... Uh, that I have this entire router VM. It's actually server 2012 uh, R2. So I have this all created and ready to go. If I were to package that up and send it to you as is and just have you import it, you can skip all of the installation of the actual VM with the CD and all that stuff and just go directly and say, boom, there it is. Here is the VM. It's ready to go, all cooked and packaged, ready to rock and roll. So that's what they call an OVA. O -O -V -A. And uh, you would then after I give it to you, you would then import it here. So I'm going to go ahead and use a distribution called Parrot OS. And uh, it's a Linux distribution. And in the security scope or field, a lot of people really dig uh, Kali Linux. And I've been using Kali Linux for quite some time, and I did like it a lot. But it actually, to me, it's a little bit performance heavy, and I always have to do a uh, extra acceleration, 3D acceleration, things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So I, I'm not as keen on that one. So what I did, is I, I seen this paired OS one here, and it's really, performance-wise, it runs really well. So uh, I found out it actually has all the same tools that Kali would have, but more. It actually has more. And uh, it just runs better for me, and I, I prefer it. So it, nothing on nothing against Kali Linux. I just prefer this one. <clears throat> so Parrot OS, I'll give you the links in the description here. You come here, and you're looking for the Parrot security. And the OVA one is the one we're looking for here. Now, the old school way I was teaching about just a minute ago with the um, CD and the ISO and stuff, you would grab it from here. But we're going to do the OVA one. So you'll download it here or torrent or mirrors, whatever you have. In this case here, it's about 5.7 gig. It's something that the Parrot OS team has created, and it's ready to go right out of the box. So you would download it and then import it. So let's do that. So I've already downloaded it. So what you would do is you would come over to File, and you would do Import Appliance. Now, on this one here, for some reason, I don't know why, but I can't really, I can't really resize these windows for some reason. And I have a hard time trying to get down the next button. So for a short time, I hate doing this because I, I don't like, I always think about the tablet and the phone users, and they don't like seeing things really, really tiny. But for just a moment, just bear with me, I'm going to switch it to a real tiny view for a second um, so that I can see the full menu. And we're going to go with the file. Let's go ahead and grab our OVA file, OVA. So we're going to pop on over here to the VMs. And there's our parrot one right there. We'll hit open and next. Here it'll actually have all of the details of what Parrot OS team has actually made this as. And then down here will be the location and we click on import. And then we'll click on agree. Okay. So while that's actually doing its business, I'm going to come back here and switch this back out to a little bit larger size there. Awesome. And let's talk a little bit about this for a second here. So what we're going to, what our intention is, is we're going to actually install this Parrot OS and we're going to open it up, but we're going to make a snapshot of a clean install of it. And what a snapshot basically does is it says, whatever it is right now, let's make a snapshot of it. If it's running great and everything's installed that I need installed and all that good stuff, then let's keep it and save it at this state so that later if I start screwing around and I blast the you know this uh, this parrot OS all the blue all the smithereens here and I destroy it through whatever I can always just restore back to the previous snapshot so we're gonna make a snapshot of it and then we're gonna bring it up and uh, make sure everything's working with it and then we'll go ahead and install docker because what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a full pen test lab scenario or environment in one single VM instead of multiple VMs, which you've seen throughout the years where people have made virtual labs. We're going to try to do it all within. Now, it is going to be real centered on uh, web application security side of things. Um, so do keep that in mind. We're going to be using vulnerable applications for it. So let's go back and check and see how we're doing over here. It looks like we have it all ready to go. So we're going to go ahead and right click on this one and we're going to go to the settings of it and we'll change the name so we can differentiated here so uh i don't know what's we'll called leroy jenkins all right let's go ahead and pop that bad boy there now what you will be looking for and again parrot os already made all the settings but you can change them any way that you want so they gave us uh, four gig of ram that's okay but for this i'm going to make it eight gig because i have 16 gig on my base and i want to be able to do the entire environment within here all the vms all the uh, attacked uh, victim machines and all that stuff within it so we'll keep it at 8096 we're going to pop over the processor because uh, parrot likes to pop about four processes in that bad boy i don't think we really need that many let's let's drop it down to two um and then um under storage you can see right there is our vdi which is the disk that was created for it and we're going to go down to network so originally when we started up, we're, we are going to need to download and install things like Docker and other things. So we're going to keep it as NAT for now. But when you do have everything as you like it and you have everything installed and Docker's there and, and everything's ready to rock, I highly recommend that you change it to something different because you got to understand the vulnerable environments that are going to be in this OS is there in the OS and it's going to be on your home network. So you're at your home network. It's you know exposable to the to the internet on that side with the router. Uh, so there is a possibility that you are exposing yourself unnecessarily. So what you should do if you're going to be practicing with these particular VM stuff is you should switch it to either internal network or host only adapter. 
So host-only adapter would essentially allow the VirtualBox DHCP server to assign IP addresses to all the VMs that pop up. And I, I, I like that one. And it will be able to communicate between the VM and the host machine, in this case being my Windows 10, and then the VM being the Parrot OS. Um, that's a good way to do it. It doesn't allow you to go out to the Internet with it. So that's a real good way to do things and segment that. The other way is the internal network where you actually have um, no communication with the host at all, and it's completely segmented from everything. Um, but you'll have to go in there and manually add the addresses in on the VMs or make a DHCP server. For now, we'll stick with NAT, though, because, again, I have to download some stuff. These other things I'm not really concerned about. Let's hit OK on that. All right, very cool. So we're going to run it for the first time by clicking on Start, and that will bring it up. Now, you'll see at first it will give some smaller views. And again, I don't like to keep things small on my videos because I'm always conscious about the tablet and the phone users that are viewing my videos. I want to make sure they can see everything fairly large. But for now, just keep in mind, we will change this. For now, that's, this is, it'll have to be kind of like this for now because we have to install something called uh, Guest Editions in order to take advantage of the auto scale mode. So I don't want to screw with the resolution and stuff manually uh, until we do that. So... For now, just understand it is going to be a little smaller to look at, but you'll get where I'm, where I'm going with it. So we're bringing up Parrot OS now, and it doesn't actually give you root user to start with, although there is a root user you can do by clicking here and going to other. Um, normally, it will start you as Parrot user, which is standard user with no real privileges. What we're going to do is we're going to actually do the root login because there's a lot of different things we want to install as root. So I'm going to go ahead and log in as root. By default, straight out installation, it's going to be root and tor, T-O-O-R, which is root backwards. So we're going to do that for the password, and we're going to go ahead and log in. Now, I don't recommend this normally on these. Uh, like if you were using it as a base OS or something like that, you don't want to run as root because if somebody breaks in, they are in as root, essentially. So, yes, it is small at first, but I'm going to take care of that in just a moment. So what we're going to do in this case here is we want to actually install the integration tools first and then make a snapshot of it, and then we'll install Docker and get busy doing that. So let's go over here to, um, let's see, what do we want to do? Let's oops, click no, I don't want that. So up here on the top, you'll see where it says devices, and this is the VirtualBox window, not the Parrot OS. I'm going to click on Insert Guest Editions CD Image. Now before I do that, let me pop open Places. So you may see over here on the left-hand side, they have the network section, and then we have the computer section. So if I were to come up here and go to Devices, Insert Guest Edition CD Image, you'll see, in just a moment, right there. It says VA, or I'm sorry, VBox, and then it has the CD-ROM 0, all that good stuff, okay? So what we're going to do in this case here is we're going to go to our root folder. I'm going to go ahead and make a new folder, and I'm just going to go ahead and call it I don't know. Uh, Chuck sounds good. And we'll open that up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this one right. Let's see, where is it? Right here. VBox Linux Editions dot run. And we're going to drop it into that folder. <coughs> All right. Very good. So what we're going to do now, close that out. Open this up. And we're going to go ahead and expand it just a little bit because, again, it's hard to see from the tablet side. And we're going to navigate over to that root folder. Actually, let's see where we're at here. We should be already in root folder. And there it is, Chuck. Now, if you want to know a little bit more about the Linux side of things, then check out, <laughs> if I can type it in correctly here, check out my uh, videos on Linux for the basics. <coughs> Sorry about that. All right, so then we go here, and there's our Linux additions. And we're going to go ahead and give it some run privileges. And again, to learn more about the Linux side of why this is the way it is, then uh, watch my Essentials videos on the basics of Linux. So we're going to go ahead and paste that in and run it. This basically gives it the ability to execute, which is what we want. So to run it, we'll go ahead and do the dot slash and uh, paste that in there. Awesome. All right, so now it's actually installing the guest editions. 
And that's going to give us the ability to do things like the copy and paste from host to the guest. Uh, give us the ability to have it auto resize the windows, those sort of things. Um, so uh, VMware has something similar to that. I just don't know what the name of it is right now. Uh, but this one here for VirtualBox is called Guest Editions. So while it's installing, let me give you a rundown of what we're planning on doing here. When we finish installing everything, we're going to make a snapshot, but then we're going to go in and install Docker. And we're going to go ahead and install these three right there, these three virtual web applications because we want to go ahead and blast them a little bit and practice on them as well for later videos. Uh, and this is a really cool script that was created here. So, you know, props to Happy Coder, happy coder.com for this. I'll leave links to this in the description. Uh, he's made it real easy, or whoever they are, they've made it real easy with a script and they use Git clone and all that. So let's go back and check here. All right, looks like we've got that ready to rock. So, what we're going to do is type in reboot and let that thing restart. And when it restarts, hopefully, it's going to have guest editions ready to rock, and we'll be able to see under view. This will be ungray. <laughs> I'm hoping. Is that a word? Ungrayed? Not grayed out? So what we're looking is, the, is to get the full screen of the Parrot OS. And now sometimes I've noticed when these come up like this, after you've done a, something like the guest editions, sometimes you'll have to minimize up here and maximize again. You'll have to do it once or twice to get it to actually catch. I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. So we'll wait for it to come up here, and then we'll log in. And then from there, we're going to shut it down after it comes up, and then we're going to make a um, snapshot of it. So we're going to log in again as root. And again, we'll do Tor for the password. And as it comes up, I'm going to go ahead and minimize and maximize and see if we can get this thing rocking. Bing, just like that. So sometimes, again, you'll have to mess with this minim, uh, this uh, maximize or restore window part right here. Now, I don't really dig on the uh, size of these menu uh, fonts because when I'm doing the videos, anybody that's watching these off of a phone or off of a tablet will have a hard time seeing that. So let's change that real quick before we do our thing there. So what we'll do for that is come down to System Preferences and then Look and Feel, and we'll go to Appearance. And we'll just change the fonts and make these screen pieces here a little bit larger. So I think 16 should be fine. Let's go up to 16. Hopefully all the tablet and phone users will be like, yeah, yeah, loving it. All right, so let's just grab all these at 16. And then we'll go ahead and shut it down and make a snapshot. Then we'll bring it back up and install Docker. And then we'll get going on installing those virtual environments. All right, as you can see, uh, a little bit bigger space, which is awesome. All right, awesome. Let's go down here, and we'll go to System, and we'll go down to Shut Down, and we'll shut down. So, like I was mentioning, while this is doing its thing, we're going to be installing those three in particular, and we're going to be navigating to them and starting them up, and that will basically show you how you can create your own virtual environment. And after I show you those three in particular, then you can do the exact same steps for the rest of them if you ever want to mess around with them. Like this Juice Shop one is really good. Uh, the Web Goats are pretty good. I haven't done these other ones here, but um, these do need some particular uh, steps when you first start them up. So we're going to go over those specifically. All right. Looks like we're now powered off for Leroy Jenkins. So right here, click this and go to Snapshots. So the current state that it's in now, we know, has the guest editions installed, and it's a brand new import. So I'm just going to basically give information in here when I say take, and I'm going to just keep it at snapshot one, and I'll say new import, and I'll say guest editions installed. Man, I'm having a hard time typing here. Here we go. So guest editions installed. That tells me what's going on with this particular snapshot. Now, the reason for it is if I ever later go ahead and screw things up and mess this VM up uh, by doing all my different hackery nonsense, I can always just come back and go to snapshot one, right click and restore, and it will bring me back to this original state. And uh, I'll have to do additional things like install Docker again, but it's all good. So right there. Uh, is our snapshot. So let's go ahead now and bring this one back up. And we'll go over here to start. And it should automatically keep the 
uh, view that we had, which was the scaled view, prior to doing the uh, additional uh, CD editions at guest editions, you would have noticed that these are always grayed out. But once we now bring it up as this, we should be able to go ahead and do it. Now, if it does come up like this when you first bring it up, it may automatically jump over to that and scale out correctly. If it doesn't, again, try to do this restore down and restore up, and hopefully that will work. So we're going to log in as root again so that we can install the Docker ones as root because we're going to do a few things as root uh, for this particular demonstration. Oh, there we go. So it does the auto scale. We're awesome. And let's go ahead and pop in as root. So again, click on other, and we'll type in root and tor, T-O-O-R, and log in. All right, so next what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that our copy and paste is ready to go. So I have my virtual environment, and then I have my guest, I mean my host OS. Under devices, you'll see there's something called shared clipboard. And I can set it to bi-directional, meaning I can copy text from here and I can copy it into or paste it into something on my home OS. So in this case here, I'm going to go to this one right there. And I'm going to grab this install Docker. Actually, you know what? Yeah, yeah, we'll do, we'll do that. So I'm going to grab that, copy it. And this is on my host machine. Now we're going to go back into my virtual machine. We'll open up our terminal now shortcut key to make this uh, bigger you do shift control and then plus 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 and all so on and so forth so we know we actually have our root directory which is here and we have chuck which has that one thing but what we do need to do is actually clone in something called pen test lab so you'll notice here that this says git clone and then this address here so if i were to go and look at this and open this up you can see here that this is what they call GitHub, and I can actually download these three things from here, okay, and put it into my machine, which includes the script that we're going to use for this. However, I can also use a command line version, something called git uh, clone, G-I-T clone. So we're going to go ahead and use that, and if git is not installed on your machine, then you'll have to do a app install git. In this case, it is already installed on Parrot, as it is the same with Kali Linux. So in this directory that I'm in right now, which is my root directory, it should make another folder in here called Pentest Lab. So let's paste that in. It will go out, find the Git page, download it, and as you can see here, we have a Pentest Lab. Okay, So that is basically how you do Git cloning. All right, so let's go ahead now and navigate over to that Pentest Lab. Take a look and see what's in there. And we can see there's a Docker install. Now, it does say Kali, but it's going to use the same script. But really, I don't want to mess with that. What we're going to do is we're going to use a command called apt install. Oh, gone. There we go. And then we're going to go ahead, and I believe it is docker.io. I believe that's what it is. So we'll say docker.io, and we'll install Docker. All right. And I'll hit yes for that. And it will ask you a few different prompts in there about do you want it to um, restart. I think it's something about restart services or something without your permission or something like that. Just do yes on those. And if you're not familiar with the Linux interface and how to navigate the cursor command in that, you'll just use your arrow keys left and right and up and down. Oh, let's see here. Uh, run app update. Okay. So in this case here, this is a good that I got this error. When you first install the... Parrot OS here, you actually have to do an update of the rep, uh, of the repositories that they have in there so that it can find where to pull these down because the repository will contain where these are at. So to do that, the very first thing which we should have done, which I didn't do, is we should have done an apt update. And what that will do is we'll go ahead and use the repository that's here in uh, Parrot, and it will go out there and get all the latest updates and whatever has changed and get all the latest information for it. And it will update all of our packages that we can, I'm sorry, not update our packages, but it will update the list that we can ask for them. And then from there, we can do a variety of things like upgrade what we currently have for tools and things like that based off of that. We're not going to do the upgrade and any of that stuff today, but we are going to do the update and then we're going to do the Docker. And then what I'll do is I'll pause the machine, I'll pause the video, and then let it fully install. 
Um, but during the Docker install, I do want to recall that there is going to be a menu that pops up asking for more interaction from you, and you'll use your arrow keys to move it to the yes or no. Just keep that in mind. All right, so it looks like we have no errors on these repository things, and we can check for packages that need to be upgraded, but we're not worried about that. So I'm going to hit my up arrow a couple times, and that replays previous commands in Linux, and I'm going to try again with the apt install Docker, but this time I don't want to answer yes or no questions in the terminal. I'll still have to answer it in the pop-up window that comes up. I'm just going to type a dash Y. Doggone, fat finger everywhere today. So I'm going to do a dash Y, which will auto yes, pretty much whatever's coming up. Hit enter, and hopefully we won't get any errors. Awesome. So that's going to be uh, that install there. So I'm going to pause it real quick here, and when we come back, We'll take a look where we left off. All right, welcome back. So we're now done with the installation of Docker. And to verify, we're going to check by typing in the word Docker and then a dash H for the help file and verify that Docker is indeed installed. And if we take a look here under the command Docker images, we can see we have none because we haven't actually downloaded anything yet. And here is the repository of where the images will be stored locally. And this will make it so that I can download containers, have them here, and not have to worry about being online for them to be able to run. It will always check to see if there's a connection out to the Docker instance or repository. But in this case, we're not going to worry about that. All right, so we have that ready to rock and roll. So what we're going to do is we're going to look here at this website that I'm going to give you guys, again, the link to. And the person that made this script already made it so that it, it runs Docker pull and it uh, sets up the networking part of it as far as giving it its own IP address. But normally what you would do without this script, let's say we wanted to... Uh, Put the or pull the actual container for BWAP, which is a purposely vulnerable environment. We would go to the actual Docker Hub site for BWAP, and you can see here that we would just basically do the Docker pull command right here, and that will install it or download it to our repository. We're not going to do that though because the guy, whoever made this awesome script here, uh, heads up to them. Awesome, um, they made it in such a way with a with a Docker file that everything is going to be created for us as far as the networking, the naming, the mapping of the IP address. And so we won't get into that in this video. It's a little bit more than we need to get into today. But if you if you ever forget what names that we're looking for to install them, these are the names that they created in that Docker file right here. So these are the commands you would run. So to install BWAP, for instance, we would run this command. Now it is a sh file, which is a shell file, so we do need to have it as dot slash so let's come back here copy and paste that into this bad boy right here and we'll click on paste so here what it's going to do first it's going to look out there and it's going to say hey do you have the image in our local repository see it says unable to find image why because we don't have jack as you can see right there so right now it's actually pulling from this site here which is the docker repository and you can see right up there same name so it's pulling from that into this uh, Linux that we have here, this Parrot OS, and it's installing everything and extracting and download complete once it's done. Now it's actually going to go ahead and grab the uh, image itself, the base image that it's based off of. Right? I, th I don't know if it's Ubuntu or what it's based I don't know what it's based off, but <laughs> whatever one they have based it off. And uh, it's going to download that first, and then when it's finished, it will tell us basically that it's started and ready to go. Anytime after this, now that it's already here and downloaded locally, we would run the same command. And the second time we would run it, it doesn't have to download it. It will actually just see it locally and just start it up based off of the Docker file that it's mapped to. So here you can see um, all the stuff is being mapped. Everything's done here. And it can be found at this location. But it looks like we have to do this install first. But before we do that, as you recall, there was nothing in our repository prior to this. So let's look at Docker images now, and you can see we now have this image, right? It tells us an image ID, uh, when it was created, size, everything, right? So we know that's there. So to start it back up, and I'm sorry, to go to it, we actually have to navigate to this location right here. So I'm going to right-click, open link, and now open up my Firefox. And for this particular one, the BWAP one, you do have to set up the install part of it first. 
So let me go ahead and uh, increase the size of this for those that are watching on the telephone or iPad or Android tablet. All right, so right here it says click here to install BWAP. I'll do that. And should be done. It says install equals yes. Looks like everything's rocking and rolling, and there we go. So now that that's done, you can now go to the login of it. And here it tells you what the credentials are for it, B and bug. So B is the login, and then bug would be the password. And then you would choose the security level and click on log. So basically from there, you would then go into all the different environments and practice. So if you want to practice your command injection, there is a vulnerability in this particular page for it. So you would go there and you would practice your injection. And that's basically how you run that. And you can say, well, I kind of suck at security, so let's keep it at low where you don't put a lot of checks in place. Or you can set it to high and to really test your metal, if, as it were. Now, keep in mind these war games and these environments are not entirely indicative of what you will find in the real world for pen testing. Um, but they're more of a training tool to kind of get you up to speed how to work out your methodology, how to work out your using the tools, how to work out timing, how to... Uh, create an automated script, maybe using Python and see how it works. That's what it's mainly used for. And I use it for training on my webs on the, on the YouTube site. So um, I have a series called Pop, 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 Another Server Drop. And that basically is going to be used in war games like these for me to teach you concepts of hacking. So even from the very beginner level, I can teach you basic ideas of TCP, UDP, and NMAP scan and stuff using these environments. So it's a great way to do it. So that's all you have to do to set up BWAP. Okay, and the other ones are pretty much the same way, but the the other the next two, I just want to show you how you would set those up um, for for this particular one. So we'll keep that here, and let's go back here to this. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this particular one um, from running the BWAP one, and then start another one. Before I do that, though, I, I don't really like these transparent backgrounds. So for your turn for changing that, you go to your terminal up here at Edit and Preferences, and you would go to Background and go to Solid Color. All right, so we got solid color. I'm going to go ahead and hit my up arrow here, and I'm going to stop BWAP, and we'll give it a second, and it will go ahead and remove it from the host file. Host file has to do with the DNS settings and such, uh, the local host file that we use for DNS. And when that's done, we're going to go ahead and do the same exact thing for Matilda. So let's go ahead and bring this back up, and we'll say start, and we'll go with Matilda. Be careful with the spelling. And again, it's going to say, hey, player, is it here locally? It's not. So it says, unable to find the image locally. So therefore, it's going to go ahead and blast out. Now, you're probably looking and seeing it already exists. That is likely going to be the image that it's based off of as far as the uh, main base image that we've already downloaded. So it's probably using the same image for all of these different ones, uh, I would guess, maybe. And that's what it's using it for. So you can see right there, extracting, downloading. And when it's done, we'll be able to go ahead and go to it because it will start it up on its own environment. All right. Extracting. Okay. Shouldn't take too much longer. And there we go. Newer image and pop. All right. So here you can see it's going to link us to this particular location here. So let's go ahead and check out Matilda. Day. See if it's up. All right. So the first thing you'll see when it comes up from Matilda Day, it says the database is offline. You'll click right here, the little link. Let me go ahead and expand this again for those watching on the awesome phones and tablets. So right there it says try to set up uh, the reset the DB. I'll click that. Click OK. And bing. There we go. So now we're ready to rock and roll in all these different cool environments that we can go to to practice on Matilda Day. So Matilda Day is a really good one because uh, you can use it. Um, uh, you can look at the code behind the page and find out what they're doing to fix it. Uh, so you can use that to try to figure out ways around it. So that's Matilda Day. Pretty awesome. Got those knocked out. Let's go ahead and stop that one as well. And then we'll go ahead and do the last one, which is DVWA. Because there's uh, something additional you have to do for that one as well. So again, these are all scripted within this, uh, what they call a Docker file that they've created for this, the person that made this particular script. And they basically, it's basically them telling you how the, or telling Docker how these are supposed to be made, stopped, started, created, those sort of things. All right, so we got that. Let's go with one more. We'll go with our DVWA. So we'll say start DVWA. 
And again, it will say the same thing. Hey, is it local? No, it's not. Okay, well, I'll download it. So it looks like this one may not be based off of the same image, but yeah, regardless. Now, if you ever forget what the names of these are when you're doing these, again, you can use this, the link that I'm going to give you guys in the description. And you can see down here it has the names for all of them that they actually named them in the script. Uh, and you can do that with any of your containers. You can name it anything you want. And uh, you would just modify it in there. This is a really good one as well. We're not going to get into that today, but this Juice Shop one is really interesting. they got a lot of cool challenges on that. WebGoat is put on by OWASP, so if you're not familiar with them, they are pretty much the standard for web application security, so they're pretty awesome. All right, let's check back and see what we're doing over here. It looks like we're downloading still. We're almost done. What's cool about doing this all within one environment, again, is you don't have to spin up multiple VMs and then dedicate certain RAM to all of those either. And these are all fairly lightweight because they're just containers that are just running the web app. That's it. It doesn't have to worry about the rest of the OS and all the other functions and all the other apps and things that are running in it. It's just, just the one thing it has. All right, so let's go and uh, right here, don't forget this. This is the username and password by default. All right, let's go visit and let's see what we got. All right, should bring us to a login page. Let's go ahead and type in the admin for the user and then password for the password. Just like a good government facility installation SCADA device password. <laughs> All right, so let me go ahead and increase this again. Uh, da, 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 da. Oops, let me drop that down a little bit. All right, so here we can see the create reset database right down here. Let's go ahead and run that. And it looks like uh, did it there. Let's see. Okay, looks like everything's good. Let's. Oh, there it is. Okay, so you have. To, I didn't click on anything there, by the way. After you did the reset database, it actually paused for a second, and then it popped this back up. So then you type in admin and password. All right, log in. And we should now have DBWA. Now, on this one here, you can also set security levels for this here under security part. And you can do the same thing where you have medium, high, and impossible. Um, but we'll be doing some videos on these as well, using these as teaching tools, this particular one, uh, because it has a lot of great stuff in it. All right, so that is basically how you set up your virtual environments. Now, in some of the other videos that I'll be doing later uh, in my series and the different playlists that you'll find, I will be using these again as, as tools to teach you how to do certain concepts. So this video I wanted to make first so that you guys can make your own environment and follow along with the videos by using the exact same setup that I'll be using. So I am going to be using this exact same setup all the time um, for those particular videos. Now for some other videos where I get into the Vulnhub stuff like the pop, 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 and other server drop stuff, I will be using... Uh, Two, v two VMs. I'll be using the Parrot OS one, and I'll probably drop that down to about four gig of RAM, and then I'll go ahead and pop in whatever VM that I'm attacking in there and make a multiple setup. Uh, don't forget that when you have all of this done and installed, it's best to shut it down, make another snapshot, but when you make your snapshot, I would change the networking to host only, or um, what was the other one? <laughs> Can't remember the name of the other one. Now. Internal network. I would change it to those, uh, if you want to not worry about address and your own VMs, then stick with the host-only one because the DHCP server, which you can change, by the way, um, under, I think it's uh, this one, Host Network Manager. Yeah. So this right here is the actual DHCP address scheme that they give. And you can see right there it says DHCP server enabled. So it's going to be using the dot, uh, the C 192.168.56.1 slash 24 network. So a class C right there. And you can go ahead and uh, edit it. Go to the properties. And you can change it to something different. So if you wanted to have it 10.0.0.1, whatever, you can do that here. But this is where you use host-only network adapting. It will take advantage of this automatically. Now you can disable it if you have your other one. Like if here I've got a router that I've created in server 2012. So I brought up a server 2012 R2, had some Active Directory installed, then I created a DNS server of my own and uh, a DHCP server as well. And I used that before for doing networking for my different VMs and stuff. So that's one way you can do it as well, or you can just use the one built into VirtualBox. So that's pretty much virtualized networking as it were, or creating a lab environment by yourself uh, in a nutshell. So. 
I'm hoping that you guys, and, and every time I use my key presses here, <laughs> it doesn't seem to do it properly, but I'll make sure here, make sure it actually did spin across. I got to worry about the key presses that I set aside for these videos here because it may do something different. Um, so that is the basic way that you can make your own virtual lab environment and, and a way for you to follow along with my web app series in that pop, pop, pop into the server drop playlist uh, where I go through the basic concepts. I'm going to pick things like cross-site scripting and do a whole video on that using these environments uh, as well as a couple other ones. Uh, but that's the gist of how you do it and how you can actually incorporate Docker into the same image itself and have one single virtual machine that is your entire attacking machine and victim machines all in one. How cool is that, right? So in that case there, you would go ahead and use your virtual box there when you're done and you would actually go ahead and where'd it go? <laughs> I think I think my virtual box, I must have closed that by accident. But you're gonna basically gonna make a snapshot of it and then you can export it as an appliance. And then if you have another machine that you're actually doing some testing on as well or a friend that you wanna give it to, then you can do the same thing and they can import it over there. And the fruits of your labor of what you've done here will then be automatically put over there without having you to recreate all of it. So I recommend shutting this down, creating a snapshot that you've installed Docker and uh, make sure you put it in the notes and then the virtual environments that you can put in there, the vulnerable machines that you put in there, note that in there as well and then save it as an export. So yeah, so that is the virtual machine part here, how to create a virtual lab. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Always make sure that you check out the uh, www.shakataganai.com and you replace the eyes with a one and you're off to the races. And I also have a variety of other different links that you can see below in the description as well. And the links to the videos and the uh, sites that I went to today are also going to be in the description. So until next time, happy hacking.